up, we have President Mike Powers, New York State Correctional Officers and Police Benevolent Association. Welcome, President. Thank you, Madam Chair. Could you introduce the people joining you? Your, I'm sorry. Could you introduce the people joining you today? I will. Uh, to my left is Executive Vice President Tammy Sawchuk. Welcome. To my right is the Northern Region Vice President Chris Hansen. Great. Thank you for being here. Thank you. And in the essence of time and your lengthy agenda here will be, will be quick. Good afternoon, Assemblyman Farrell, Senator Young, and esteemed members of the Fiscal Committees. Thank you for allowing me the opportunity to speak today on behalf of my entire membership regarding the Governor's proposed budget for the upcoming fiscal year. My name is Michael Powers, and I have the privilege of serving as President of the New York State Correctional Officers and Police Benevolent Association, known as NICE-COBA. Among other titles, NICE-COBA represents approximately 20,000 dedicated correctional officers and sergeants who are charged with maintaining the care, custody, and control of our state's prison population, a thankless job that is becoming more dangerous each year. With me today, as I, I mentioned, so I'll, I'll begin by stating the obvious. Since we visited with you a year ago, the correctional system in New York State has faced the greatest challenge in its recent history. Of course, I'm talking about the escape at Clinton Correctional Facility last June. We are all waiting for the Inspector General to complete her investigation, an investigation we trust that will not only reveal the specific facts associated with the escape, but will also address the root causes of such a breakdown in one of the most critical institutions in our society, namely our correctional facilities. When the investigation is complete and we have had the time to thoroughly digest its findings and conclusions, I can assure you that NICE-COBA will clearly, forcefully, and frequently share its recommendations for how New York's correctional system can be improved. NICE-COBA can do this because of the working knowledge its members have of our correctional system. We have shared these recommendations with the administration and with prior administrations. And we will continue to do so until the one goal of every corrections advocate, regardless of political or ideological persuasion has been achieved. That goal is the dramatic reduction in violence that afflicts inmates and staff alike within the walls of New York's correctional facilities. Some of you remember, may remember our testimony from last year. For the first time, we presented visual displays of the amount of violence that afflicts New York's correctional system. Sadly, I'm duty bound to share an even more troubling display than we provided last year. According to data gathered by the Department of Corrections and Community Supervision, inmate-on-inmate inmate assaults grew by 6% in 2015 and are up 47% from their low, recent low watermark of 2009. Inmate-on-staff assaults grew by 20% last year and are up more than 70% from the recent low in 2012. There is also an explosion in the amount of contraband in the correctional system, up nearly 24% from just the prior year. Unfortunately, we are not aware of any data on the amount of K2 or other drugs possessed by inmates, but anecdotal evidence in the contraband data suggests that they are rampant in most, if not all, facilities. Let, re let me remind you that this alarming rise in assaults and confiscation of contraband have been occurring while the inmate population has been falling by more than 5%. Let me also repeat that it is our belief that no one supports the more violent system depicted by these graphs we just do not agree on the root causes of this epidemic or how to reverse it. I would like to clearly and concisely state what the dedicated professionals of NICE-COBA believes. We believe it takes resources to effectively provide care, custody, and control of inmates. This is especially true because of a larger percentage of the inmates inhabiting correctional facilities. Nearly two out of three have been convicted of violent felonies. It is also the case that inmates that were originally assigned to maximum security facilities based on the nature of their conviction have been reshuffled to medium security facilities to address overcrowding at the maximum security prisons. Overcrowding, I should mention, that still exists today. The necessary resources I just mentioned come in the form of a sufficient number of regularly and uniformly trained correction officers outfitted with equipment that enables them to both do their job and return home safely to their family each night. While we are encouraged by the increase in correctional facilities position, positions that have been filled in the current fiscal year, we have not yet reached a staffing ratio that allows posts critical to the safety of inmates and staff to remain open as their security plan dictates. Meaningful training is not regularly available once a correction officer leaves the academy. 
All too often, what is provided does not focus on the tools and techniques corrections officers need to provide security to a facility. While we are encouraged by the additional money proposed in this budget for better equipment at Clinton and certain other facilities, in many cases, the equipment correction officers rely on is embarrassingly outdated and inadequate. And we are not talking about high-tech devices you may see in the movies. We're talking about basic needs such as flashlight, flashlights, batons, radios, vehicles, and the like. NICE-COBA has articulated its stance on these critical issues frequently and consistently at hearings like this and through official channels like labor management meetings at both the state and facility levels. All too often, the response has been a polite acknowledgement, but no meaningful follow-through by the department. NICE-COBA hopes that the release of the Inspector General's report will spur meaningful and concerted action to reform a correctional system that had already been in crisis prior to June of 2015, a crisis that no one can now deny. The men and women of NICE-COBA, each of whom walked the toughest beat in law enforcement, as Senator Nozzolio often states, remain committed to such reform. Thank you again for the opportunity to share our views. We'll do our best to answer any questions you may have. Thank, Thank you, you, President Powers. Senator Gallivan. <laughs> Thank you, Madam Chair. Mr. President, thanks for your testimony, the work that you and, and of course, all of your members do. We all acknowledge that this past year has been a challenging year. Um, I sense uh, some of the frustration in your voice that we share uh, while we all wait for that Inspector General report. The, I know that you sat through, the, through Commissioner Anucci's testimony. Uh, there was talk about resources. There was, there was talk about uh, certainly an emphasis on safety and security in facilities. Um, I, actually, we, I actually talked with them uh, with the same data that you made reference to in your testimony here. Uh, you know, and he acknowledged that and that something needed to be done. But nonetheless, he, they out, he outlined some things in his testimony, focusing on technological enhancements, training improvements, and policy changes. The one thing that we did not talk about, we did not talk about the proper classification of inmates. Um, and I recognize that, point noted, and I share that concern. But, but nonetheless, uh, as he talked about the technological enhancements, training improvements, policy changes, he, he mentioned a number of different things, like expanded use of canine units, elimination of metal containers and the such. Uh, what other things do you think need to be done that he did not mention uh, to ensure that our facilities are safe and secure for everybody? Through much of our communication with the department and the administration, much of our concerns are actual posts. While we recognize a rise in our staffing levels, which still has quite a ways to go to, to, to balance out and to be effective in the field, what, we, what, we, what we're lacking are actual posts in our facilities. We have an issue with post closings and actual posts in the facilities and, and the staff to staff it. Um, that, that, that's just one of many things. Uh, you know, he mentioned uh, new technology. Can we, stay, can we stay with the post for a minute? So post closings, I understand. When you say post, do you mean that there are some, there are posts that you believe should exist that do not? Yes. That's correct. And, and, and with the post closings, as you're familiar with, create breaches in security in the facility. If I can give you an example real quick here and, and for something for you to understand, as, as you look outside of this hall, and you recognize the men's room on the other side of this, this wall over here. And the angle of which that hall jets and comes down, if, if the men's room or the hallway down at the end of the hall was a, a, an area of recreation and that post was closed and we didn't have a staff member in there, you can see the blind spot from the front of this, the entrance of this hall. And then as we come down the hall, we don't have security staff there. And that could be a viable post. I mean, and sometimes those posts get closed. And that's where the staff comes in to be able to allow us to staff those positions in, in some of the blind spots in our facilities. 
What President Powers is, is saying is that you could give us 100 new correction officers, but if you close 100 posts, we've gained nothing. No, I understand about the post closings. What I wanted to understand better was the, the existence of your belief that additional posts should exist. Now, I, I'm assuming that, so, I think I understand correctly that that becomes part of the staffing security analysis that you have the opportunity to weigh in on? We do, we do. We've, and, and as Tammy was alluding, we have, we've seen an increase in, in, in items, officers, but we're not seeing the posts that are critical in our facilities. Would you be able to follow up and be more specific for the various facilities? I mean, I don't mean today, Absolutely. but it, like going through the facilities. With, with anybody, of course. I mean, the things that you think should exist that don't. There was some discussion with, with the commissioner about the renaming, restructuring of the Office of Special Investigations. What are your thoughts about that? Uh, I know they had their issues a while back. Um, I, I believe those issues still exist. Um, we have our own concerns with OSI. Um, we realize that it's new and they may be feeling their way, but that doesn't stop the day-to-day -day operations that, that we have. You know, they talk of new plans and implementation, yet they discipline us towards the old style, so to speak. We're, we're coming in thanks to a lot of our intervention and a lot of our barking, if you will, to the department to implement new changes. And we're starting to see some of that, but we're being treated as if we're the old guard, so to speak. And it's, it's becoming an issue for us. And it's coming through timeliness, through disciplines towards staff, and towards the lack of discipline sometimes to deter criminal activity in our correctional settings. Is it, is it your opinion or is it, do you have any thoughts on whether or not uh, the so-called internal affairs, for la lack of a better way of saying it, uh, should be run by the department or should there be separate outside oversight as some have proposed? If you have thoughts. We provide care, custody, and control. You know, we're charged with providing that. Um, we have our issues. We share them with the department um, and, and, and in the interim until, it, 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 until we either get the fair shake that we just rightly deserve, then we'll, we'll decide whether or not we proceed forward with any of our concerns. Fair enough. Right, thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Senator. Anyone on the assembly side? Good. Senator Nazolio. Thank you. Very much, Madam Chair. Uh, President Powers, always good to see you. Thank you for uh, the work that your members do each and every day to keep us safe. Thank you. Uh, that's not said enough. Uh, it's, I appreciate the, you quoting me, and uh, uh, I hope those words live forever. The fact is, you do walk the toughest law enforcement beat in America. Uh, your members are uh, put in harm's way each and every day, each and every hour of every day, uh, with no, nothing much to protect them other than their wits and their, your abilities. Uh, there's $47 million of capital money in the state budget proposal by Governor Cuomo to reflect the uh, settlement uh, with the special housing, the SHU settlement, the special housing. Uh, that NYSCOBA and I worked very closely when I uh, had uh, Senator Gallivan's responsibilities and uh, closely on the issue of establishing different special housing for those mentally ill inmates. And I must say, NYSCOBA was terrific in ensuring the seamless transition of that very major program in our state correctional facilities. Uh, it wasn't easy, uh, but major expenditures done at Auburn, done at uh, even Five Points, who didn't have 
uh, that type of uh, facility uh, constructed. Tell us what types of anticipated concerns or protocols, procedures, safety issues uh, that you see uh, in the development of this new settlement. And uh, just to preface that question with the statement that I understand what special housing has been. It's been to, in many cases, uh, certainly in some cases to discipline, but in many cases to ensure the protection of the inmate. Uh, so it, it, an inmate who uh, may have needed uh, special housing. But tell me what this new settlement uh, looks to uh, develop. Well, thank you for the acknowledgement. Uh, we consider ourselves the best in the nation in, in this line of law enforcement. And uh, it, it's a good question, and I'm glad you asked, because quite frankly, you're the only one that's asked us. Uh, and with that being said, you know, minus the mental health aspect, and, and the commissioner mentioned, I believe, 18 percent. I believe you mentioned 18 percent of the population has mental health issues, and the, and the NICLU settlement addresses that quite well. Um, but from a disciplinary standpoint, when you take out the mental health issue, from a disciplinary standpoint and an operational standpoint in the Department of Corrections and Community Supervision to keep the facilities operating in a timely fashion, some these these this this new settlement has doesn't um, have a deterrent to criminal activity, and there's there's plenty of criminal activity inside the walls and fences of our correctional facilities, and and I'm not to say that uh, you know a majority of them go to program go to you know they're looking for the rehabilitation process, but we have a small factor, and that factor that comes into play that acts out criminally doesn't have the deterrent anymore after a short shoe sentence or a, or, a, or, or a longer one to come back out and modify his behavior or her behavior from that aspect. I, I believe Tammy could speak a bit on it as, as well as she's a, uh, a supervisor in a shoe for many years and, and uh, we, you know, I mean, we have our concerns with it, but we implement it, we'll roll it out because we are the best at what we do. And, you know, we'll, we'll work with it we'll have to wait and see. I mean, in 2014, the interim stipulation settlement that was agreed to in the NICLUS case um, didn't significantly drop the numbers of, of acts of violence in our facilities. And with the introduction, reintroduction of heroin and, and the uh, introduction of K2 and the epidemic of K2 that the, uh, even the commissioner acknowledges has created a very violent workplace and it's created a, a, a a mode of behavior that doesn't have a deterrent to bad behavior. Do you think that the, this proposal are you suggesting will basically eliminate, uh, significantly reduce at best the deterrent factor uh, in, in terms of inmate discipline? I'm sorry, could you repeat that? This settlement, this proposal to uh, construct additional SH or to, to retrofit the housing uh, taking, do you believe it takes away the deterrent tool of, uh, that exists today uh, for deterrence uh, yes. with special yes. housing? Yes. So that, um, it, how, to those who haven't worked in our correctional facilities, what does that mean? If there's a criminal act that takes place in the, in the correctional setting, uh, I'll give you an example. If we suspect somebody of using a narcotic inside the facility and we test them for that narcotic, there's usually a, a you know, there could be a confinement, they could be confined from their programs, confined from recreation, confined from certain privileges that they get. Um, not necessarily visitation, but, or anything family related, they still have correspondence and everything that, with that, but from a, from a, a privilege inside the facility, they'll, they could lose that. That's being modified significantly at this point with, with this settlement. And that is not, you know, we'll continue to see the action. If an individual didn't submit to the urine example, the urine sample in, in the urine analysis, then he, the penalty's not there anymore. So, you know, is there a deterrent for drug use? No. 
very difficult situation going to be made worse. Makes it very extremely difficult for our frontline staff. Uh, my time is long since up. Thank you very, very much uh, for your uh, work and your testimony. Thank you. Th thank you for your thank service you, to the people of the state of New York. And uh, best wishes. thank you, President Powers, and all of you for what you do for us on behalf of the people of New York State to keep us safe every single day. We appreciate you very much. So thank you. Thank you for thank your you. time. Thank you.